All right. So people are starting to join in. Um, hello, everyone who's joining us. Um, if you want to say hello in the chat, you're more than welcome to. Um, you can say when you're where you're coming from today. We have people from all over Muskoka and beyond. So you can do that just using that chat feature down there. Oh, wonderful. Hello from Lake of Bays. Excellent. Um, so if you have any questions as we go, we do have a Q&A button down there as well. And we will have a Q&A session at the end of the talk. So if you have questions, um, it doesn't matter when you put them in there, um, we'll look at them, all of them at the end. So if you have questions now, you can get them in there first, um, but it will be open the whole time. And hello from Port Carling. And we'll just um, give it a few minutes because we're just at seven o'clock now and um, we will get this going. Oh, and from Gravenhurst, wonderful. So you have people from all over Muskoka joining in. It's nice to see. There better be some people from the Bracebridge Library as well. So you can say hello. Um, and we're just gonna give it a few more minutes for everyone to join in. Oh, and from London, hello. Thank you so much for joining. From Huntsville, hello. Oh, and from Toronto, hello. All right, so, um, this is a Zoom webinar for people who have joined us um, before, you'll know how it goes. Um, so we do have the chat feature and we have the Q&A. So if you have questions, please pop them in the Q&A and we'll get to that at the end of the talk. Um, the chat is great for saying hello, where you're from. Um, if you have comments about things, um, you can definitely share that in the chat feature. Um, because it's a Zoom webinar, we can't see you and we can't hear you, but we are recording this. So if you want to uh, watch it later, if you have to leave for whatever reason, if you wanna share it with your friends, um, you'll be able to find it on your library's YouTube channel. And we also have a lot of our other author talks posted up on our YouTube channel, so you can see that. I know the Bracebridge Public Library is a little bit behind in posting ours, but I know that um, the other libraries have been really good at putting them up right away. Um, so lots of people from Bracebridge joining in. Wonderful, hi everybody. Um, if you decide that you would like your very own copy of um, When We Lost Our Heads at the end of the night, um, you can contact your local Muskoka library. You can do that um, tonight, you can do that tomorrow morning. Um, what we do is we collect all the numbers for everyone who wants books and then we contact the publisher and they send them to us and then they go to the libraries and then you can pick up your book and pay for it at the library and each book comes with a signed book plate so if you would like one make sure that you contact your library either tonight or tomorrow morning um, if you have already purchased the book and you would like a signed book plate then just let your library know um, because we can get an extra one for you so you can pop that in your own copy um, if you are interested in these talks, um, please join uh, your library's newsletter, uh, join their social media pages because we have lots of amazing authors coming up this year and um, all the different libraries take a turn. So um, you will might have someone from um, Muskoka Lakes or from Gravenhurst or from Huntsville moderating the next one. So it's lots of fun. So make sure that you are joining your library's newsletter or you can usually pick it up in print as well at the library that you're following the websites, social media. Um, so you can find out what's coming up next. Um, and let's see how we're doing. It's going to make sure that people are all getting in okay. 
and then we'll get this started. All right, um, so we begin this event by acknowledging that Muskoka is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, specifically the Chippewa and the Ojibwe peoples, and the Algonquin. We also recognize the Wada Mohawks who relocated to Muskoka in 1881. Uh, the treaties for the land we live on are the Jay Collins Land Purchase of 1785 and the Williams Treaty of 1923. We are thankful for the opportunity to meet here and reaffirm our commitment and our promise and challenge of the truth and reconciliation here in our community. My name is Sarah McNeil and I am one of the information and digital services librarians at the Bracebridge Public Library. Our guest tonight is best-selling novelist, short story writer, essayist, Heather O'Neill. Her novels have received so much and very well-deserved acclaim, and I know we are all thrilled to have her with us tonight. So welcome, Heather. Um, the book that we are talking about um, tonight is her newest novel. I have it here. Um, and it is um, When We Lost Our Heads, and it is gorgeous. Um, and it is a spellbinding story about two young women whose friendship is so intense, it not only threatens to destroy them, it changes the course of history. Um, and if you just want to say in the chat, um, if you've read it already, you let us know. Uh, we won't have any spoilers in this conversation, um, but if you have already read it, we'd love to know. Um, the book has kind of two main uh, female characters. There's Marie Antoine, and she's the charismatic spoiled daughter of a sugar baron. And of course, Sadie Arnett, who is dark haired, sly and brilliant. And it talks about their childhood growing up together and the havoc that they wreak on Montreal. Um, if you are unfamiliar with um, Heather O'Neill's writing, then you'll be in for a treat um, because it is quirky, it's delicious, and um, you will have so much fun uh, reading her books. So I highly recommend it, especially her new book, When We Lost Our Heads. So Heather, what inspired you to write this book? Um, thank you, Sarah. It's nice to be here. And thanks for the Ontario Library Service and everybody joining in. Um, what inspired me to write this book? Um, a lot of things. I think I originally, I sort of had this idea all of a sudden. Um, I really was interested in that time period, Victorian Montreal or the Industrial Revolution when Montreal was sort of just literally being built in all the neighborhoods. And um, then I had saw a painting when I was kind of looking, researching this time and there was, it was an ice ball and the girls, there were some girls who were dressed up in, as French revolutionary characters like Robespierre and Marie Antoinette. And then I had this funny idea of what if I sort of um, took these figures and made them into young girls who were in the Victorian era and dealing as opposed to um, the sort of lower class, upper class issues of the French Revolution, but they were um, relating it back to women because it was at the beginning of the first wave of feminism. So you have all these uh, young, very young Victorian women who are actually um, these kind of very ambitious, bloodthirsty revolutionaries. And I, I love that juxtaposition. So I kind of took the novel from there and built it. Mm -hmm. And you were born and raised in Montreal and you live in Montreal, you're joining us from Montreal. Um, and I really felt that Montreal almost felt like another character or another few characters in the book. Um, why, I mean, was there any other tie-ins that you really chose to write about Montreal or do you, is it just your home and you love it? Um, I guess probably primarily because it's my home and I've sort of, 
um, just always been interested. I mean, wherever I am, I'm sort of interested in the origins of a city and how it comes to be. I, I like cities. I like cities as as living, breathing beings who kind of take on characteristics and become almost magical realists. I mean, that's how I always saw the city. And Montreal just does have a kind of like a fascinating history and it's um, a very romantic city. So everybody's kind of regarded its history or turns it into these little romantic stories. Like you grew up, you know, I grew up in Montreal just hearing stories about the underworld and gangsters and all this sort of wonderful um, bad behavior we've always engaged in, but I've been very proud of. So I kind of, I always liked I think that way of spitting Montreal into a story um, kind of touched me as a child. And I started doing that just um, in an intuitive way. And yeah, I just, I've always found little uh, interesting historical parts and ideas about Montreal that have inspired me. I mean, so far. Yeah. Um, what kind of, research did you do for the book other than collecting these stories um research was research was actually um it was pretty wide ranging because i was taking two historical periods and putting them together but then at the same time i'm talking about very contemporary issues so but anyways as far as the two periods i had to research um the victorian era in montreal and the Golden Mile, which is the aristocratic neighborhood that I describe, was quite was easier because it's still there and you can kind of go visit different places and they kind of historically, they have so many records of their ridiculous balls that they've had or different um, societies. So there was a lot to kind of go through and get the fabric of it in the sense of um, what it would be like to go on the top of the hill. And of course, when I went down to the bottom of the hill and wanted to create the squalid mile, that area doesn't exist anymore. It was like, you know, just shoddily built. So I had to really go into museum archives to find anything and search and search for, um... so my dog's gonna start howling. It won't last long. Um, it's a chihuahua. I just really wanted to, I think it was an opera singer in his last life, but then probably did something horrible for a role. And now he's condemned to be a chihuahua. Oh no. I think, I feel like we've all learned to, yes, deal with pets and Zoom. And it's been an interesting challenge for all of us, but we might have to see him. Since I'm only he's... pausing because I can't hear a thing. Okay, great. He's finished his, his um, Concerto. So anyway, so going down, uh, yeah, it was really difficult to find just the way the streets looked and the, how a, a brothel. So I was looking at the sex workers at that time and that kind of stuff. Like, as I said in the book, it's a lot of unwritten history and the history of women. So kind of, especially with lower class women and the way they lived was very hard to find. And then I was looking for details of um, some of the most fascinating stuff was within the factories because we think of the industrial revolution as such um, such an era that was driven by men and we just visualize men going to the factory, but so many women worked in the factory and starting when they were quite young and little girls were all in the factory and they had quite um, very dangerous jobs of jumping in between um, going into the machines while they were working and cleaning them out of scraps with their tiny fingers and um, just horrible things were happening and they got paid next to nothing. So it was just all that, just searching and searching. And then of course, then I went um, to look at the French revolutionary characters that I wanted each one to have a tiny um, sort of echo or inspiration. But that was, that was a little bit, I had always been researching the French revolution because I just, as even as a child, was so fascinated by the characters and personalities from the revolution who who all sort of started as writers and orators and um, I was very interested in the um, the power of the text and what it does in a revolution how the power of any text can sort of um, completely undo a society mm -hmm. and there's lots of 
writers and orators in the in the book as well. So how yeah. um, did you have? Do you think you have more fun writing about writers than other characters, or is there a difference in writing about them? Um, I mean, I suppose because I always am. The, so the character in the book who's the writer is Sadie Arnett, who um, I kind of based her a bit on the character of the Marquis de Sade, who was, um, you know, from the word sadism, who was this famous pornographer at the time. So she wants to become this world famous pornographer and write all these uh, erotic books for women. And um, so, writing a writer is very fun because I have the same passion so I just know what goes into it and even every time that Sadie begins writing in the novel like I mean she discovers writing as a child and she just becomes addicted to it and that feeling of the pen just being like a magic wand and you put it on the page and anything can come out of it the most subversive crazy radical thing that's in your head you can just put on the page so Sadie's pen whenever she starts to write like her her words turn into ribbons and and birds and floating things because I just wanted to um capture that feeling that I get when I when I write in a notebook and the the sort of the way it just absorbs you it makes you feel in some way just so omnipotent even though it's over this small fictional world but you're just building you're just world building and it's so satisfying mm -hmm. there's a lot um in your book about women and um i mean women in relationships but also women in power and um lots of different power dynamics and stuff and i don't know that i would have um, put together like the French Revolution and feminism, but the way that you do it in your book is just amazing and it makes so much sense. Um, feminism has been going through lots of changes recently yeah. and a lot of the things that you talk about and a lot of the themes that are pulled are things that um, have been happening in the news, like with um, white women and black women and what it means to be a white feminist. Um, were these things that were actively in your mind when you were writing the novel? Oh, absolutely. It's, um, it's sort of, that's what I would, the, like the question of feminism, because these women, um, first they're living in that, that era, the Victorian era, everything a woman did was curtailed, like from the way she spoke, the way she laughed, the way she presented herself at the dinner table so and they were crinoline so they were just literally in cages they put on a cage and then they put their dress over top it um so there was um very much discussion about how one breaks out of these gender roles how one becomes ambitious and pursues one's goals but then there is also i mean sadie and marie are both incredibly, although they're delightful and I adore them, they are very problematic figures in that they they have, um, yeah, what is sometimes referred to as white feminism or girl boss feminism or this, a feminism that isn't intersectional. All they care about, all they're taking from feminism is that they want to succeed and they are going to push everybody out of their way. And then, and then Marie gets to the top of this. She becomes the sugar baron of sorts and she becomes even worse than any of the male bosses and then it questions you know then a lot of the other women in the book who are part of the revolution just question this and they're like that is that the goal of feminism just to become as outrageous and um, domineering as men was it not to destroy the patriarchy so we could all sort of um, improve and women from the lower classes from more diverse backgrounds so yeah, it definitely challenges um, that in different ways of looking at feminism and what exactly is a goal of feminism instead of seeing it in this sort of capitalistic, like um, one woman breaks the ceiling and just joins the men and leaves every, all the other women at the bottom. Yeah, um, and I mean, the great thing is with your book is that it's not heavy handed at all. I think it, it is seamless. It just flows so wonderfully in the story. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh yeah, this. Um, so that was, it was super enjoyable. And I really liked that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, 
the, I was just gonna say those are like the themes and it's like but you can read you could read the book without the themes like at the core it's um like this crazed love story of two um young girls who become completely obsessed about each other so you can that's a fun thing I mean that's why I love uh literary fiction is you can read it on so many levels you could just read it for the for the joy of following along these completely audacious um radical and disturbing young psychopathic women or you can and then you can if you think about it more there's all these other layers to it yeah I guess because at the heart of it it is about their their friendship mm -hmm. um did you I mean I doubt that you based it off of I hope you didn't base it off of a friendship because it's <laughs> a very destructive friendship but did you um, have any friendships that you kind of pulled experiences from or any like famous friendships that you were like, oh, this is what I'm going to write about here? I think what I did was I was, I think I did kind of base it on um, the sort of intense relationships that I've had over the course of my life. And I was so interested in also kind of showing that dark, the darker edges to friendship, because we always think about friends as um, being supportive and wonderful and close to us. But friends are also like our, the people who affect us the most. We just have these other like underlying feelings where we're so jealous, we get afraid of them succeeding. We like, we hate the fact that we're just, so adoring of them and like we have this need a fundamental need as a human to be independent so when someone we become so obsessed with someone then you just secretly somehow want them to perish so that you can have your freedom back even though you adore them so i was interested in those complexities of uh friendship that i don't always um i hadn't always read talked about especially with female friendships it was always um yeah i like the sort of dark undercurrents that for any kind of love there's always something twisted in it yeah um yeah definitely a lot of times you run into more softer versions of uh friendship in books so it was it was a fun change to see something so different um i think especially with things like social media there's definitely this feeling of like one-upping people around you so yeah <laughs> or maybe it's me it's funny because when you do these talks you're like maybe i'm just revealing like these crazy sides of myself and i'm like you know when you just want to murder your friends and everyone's like no no heather we don't <laughs> <laughs> oh sorry i just you just as a writer you just kind of dig inside yourself and you find these things and you assume that writers i mean the readers will um know of these things too Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't think that maybe bodes well for your friends, but it definitely, <laughs> definitely makes a great book. <laughs> um, we have um, tons of writers in Muskoka. We have lots of um, aspiring authors and people who are um, publishing with small presses. Um, what is your process like when you get started on a book? um process uh usually i'll have that sort of general idea which um some somehow comes to me visually it's just something excites me about the idea and there's something unknowable about it too because once you go in you're going to be spending uh, a few years so it's always something new and something that provokes me and that i i want to work on um but then the actual I think it depends. I think with this, um, this one particularly, I worked on first the characters because I wanted to have first my cast of characters and then I was going to see how they um, interacted and related and which was an interesting process because I had invented them and I had, I originally didn't really know who was going to be my main character. I thought it would probably be the one um, based on Robespierre, just because I love that historical figure. So I went in thinking that Robespierre would probably be the principal character. But then um, Marie and Sadie, they 
after, as soon as I created them with any scene they were in, they just fought for the attention. You couldn't notice anybody else. They were so domineering. And then they met each other and they just kind of fell in love. And the, every time I wrote, like, cause I just do sketches to kind of build the tone and what, it, what it will feel like. And, um, yeah, like, uh, Sadie and Marie, every time they got together were so intense. It was like, you know, it was just like two girls who had met and they had that cooked food the way they do in the book. So um, they sort of became the main characters and then I built the idea of a plot around it. That's, a, I mean, it totally makes sense that they would take over. Yeah. Um, <laughs> from... <laughs> of course they everything. took over. It's so excessive. And of course they took like the, the spotlight away from Mary. Like that's <laughs> <laughs> just makes sense. Oh, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. You had one uh, comment saying that they're really enjoying the discussion, but they haven't read the book yet. So don't worry. We're not, I mean, there's so many things that happen in the book um, and we won't spoil the details for you. Um, yeah, did you do you did you have an idea about like the ending or was that kind of a did things happen as a surprise or we're not now that we just said no spoilers, but um, I did have an an idea for the ending, but I, I didn't know how it was gonna get there because I just knew there was this like because I was also writing it almost as a structure of a Victorian novel and growing up I just a I mean, I adore Victorian novels with their ridiculous like twists and the grandiose like worlds they create. So I knew there was like these big surprises and it, but it was, it was took a lot of patience and work to build um, a novel that would allow um, these shocking things to be revealed and, and uh, secrets and whatnot. That's always fun. Like when you have, um, the, uh, when you create something that the, uh, the reader is supposed to pick up clues along the way without knowing they're picking up clues. So that's always um, really fun as a writer to put in these, these details that are gonna stick with them, but they don't know why they're sticking with them, but you don't wanna make it obvious that it's sticking with them because they'll guess, they'll guess all the, the intrigue and conclusions. It's definitely fun as a reader too, because then, it really, it lends itself to rereading. So you can be like, oh wait, didn't that happen? And then you can go back and feel like you can read it again and enjoy all those little bits because you're in on the secret now. So but that's, yeah, because then as a writer, it's like when you have these kind of twists at the end, it makes the reader reread it in their head anyways. It forces you to somehow go like, oh, and then you go back and you, reread it anyways, even if you don't want to go back. So you make your, it's fun. I th I find that um, rewarding. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Definitely. And it, it's really good for discussion. So, I mean, if there's, if there's book clubs who are looking for a book, um, I mean, there's, there's lots of stuff to talk about in the book, which is great. Um, I know I, I was listening to some of your other um, events that you've done on YouTube and there's so many things that people talk about and pick up. Um, so people can go on definitely and watch some of those and have new things discussed. Um, one thing I saw it was that it took you three years to write the book. So I don't, is that average for you or is that a bit longer? Um, I think it is, I mean, I've written five books, so I, it's hard to average out, but I think it's, I think it's about averaging maybe a bit shorter, maybe a bit long. Yeah, I think, I don't know, but not, I'd say like three, yeah, three years is a, is a good kind of period, but it was five years from my last book because I had started writing one that I was not happy with. So I had to throw it away. And um, yeah, because it's really funny. You just don't know when you're writing sometimes you go, I mean, that's a terror. That's why it's terrifying. I mean, terrifying, whatever. Um, everyone's using such extreme words and language these days. Um, that's one of the, uh, something that's trepidatious about writing novels is you can just go for, 
for you have an idea then you pursue it for years and then you realize it wasn't actually a good idea and then when do you abandon it because all novels at some point you desperately want to abandon so um i don't know yeah sometime between three and five years i guess is the average <laughs> <laughs> I always you think I always have this idea like, like my, my next book I'm gonna just do it in like six months but it's or yeah. like a year but it's just um it's just impossible like James Patterson um <laughs> no, James Patterson has a whole team of people you know he has like 10 people writing his books I don't know like 10 Heathers <laughs> oh no <laughs> oh, oh my goodness um are you are you working on something well do you do you know if you're working on something now are you yeah I'm working on another novel um that's kind of I mean I'm not say too much about it but it's like a a fable set in this imaginary country which tells you nothing I know but um I'm just superstitious about talking about my novels before they're done, partially because I feel like when I talk, if I talk about them and they'll sound like so ridiculous, I'll just like lose all faith in them. But um, because they do sometimes sound, they sound ridiculous when you're working on them. I actually remember um, I was talking to this writer in Montreal and then um, when Jan Mar yeah, Martel was living in Montreal and he was finishing uh, Life of Pi and this other writer um said oh my god I ran into like Jan Martel and he told me what he's working on and I just felt so sorry for him like he's really lost his mind <laughs> which of course went on to be life of pot but yeah I saw him on the street corner he's like yes I'm writing a book about a little boy in a boat with um a tiger and my friend was like Jan has lost the plot man <laughs> But that shows you, right? You never exactly. know. You exactly. never know. And you don't know what these these ideas. Sometimes you have you think you have the most amazing idea that's foolproof, but then it just doesn't work on the page. And then sometimes that's why I always do these kind of little sketches and scenes to see how that idea, um, if it's gonna translate into an actual story. And somehow mm -hmm. just there's just a feeling like the words vibrate in a different way when it's working. Yeah, no. Um, did you have any advice for writers who are starting out or who are struggling as they go? Um, I think like, I think just writing all the time is really important. And there's, um, you just have to write and write like when you first start writing, it's almost as though you have like terrible, terrible words inside you. And it's like, it's practicing like an instrument. Like if you pick up a violin, um, it's just not gonna sound good, but it's like that with writing, you just write. And that's how I always think of it. Like you're just exercising all the bad lines and ideas out and once they're out and all of a sudden one day after, I don't know how many years and it starts to have this voice which resonates with you. And you're like, oh, that's what I was after. So. I guess it's just practice and then also showing I think it's really important like also I show in this book like the writer character has um, a friend who's an editor and they always go back and forth. I think it's really, really important if you find like a community who can help you write so if you join a writing group or um, a class at the library like just the power of showing someone else what you're writing. It just uh, you just end up editing and making it better there's no. I don't think there's any way to kind of do it secretly in your room to produce a novel. You have to just throw the pieces out where they go. Yeah. And not be disheartened if they tell you a tiger with a little boy in a boat is silly. <laughs> that is true. Um, I'm just going to take a second to remind everyone um, that we do have the Q&A um, down at the bottom. So if you have questions as we go, then um, please, please, please put your questions um, in the Q&A section because there's no questions in there yet. So um, you could for sure have your question answered if you 
put it in the <laughs> Q&A. Um, and did you, was there any um, favorite part that you had in your book or favorite character, something that you're, you especially love and would like everyone to? Um, hmm. I sometimes like, uh, I like, so I like to do these little set pieces sometimes in my novels. So there's this scene, uh, there's like an interlude in the book where I had, because one of the characters, one of the few male characters is Marie's father, whose name is Louis. And he's this, um, he's like a philanderer to the, you know, he's just a sex addict and it's essentially, and he's always sleeping with, um, uh, lower class women and maids and just takes advantage of everybody um but then he has all these illegitimate children all over Montreal so there's this scene where I just look at all these little girls in Montreal who are possibly his illegitimate children and that was really fun because it, they just have the strangest jobs I was just looking for the most absurd places you could put little girls so I was looking through um and finding Victorian occupations for children, which are always fascinating. So there was, there's one girl who works with the collecting of rats because you could sell rats to like um, dog fights and stuff. And there's one who goes and gets leeches and one who's um, grave robbers. So there are all these extraordinary, and chimney sweeps. So extraordinary little jobs for young girls within um, the Victorian era. And I remember just having a lot of fun with that, just visually and, and um, the little like these little delicate um young funny little girls in the midst of all the horror and squalor that was um the turn of the century yeah um I really enjoyed those like kind of little scenes or almost like a I think like a tableau in like yeah. a, like a vaudeville show when there's like little spotlights you did that for um the women at the brothel as well which was um delightful so that was really yeah. enjoyable it's funny because a lot of people bring up that scene to me because because when you write a book you don't actually know what's going to resonate with people and then there's stuff you think everyone's gonna like we're gonna blow their minds but nobody mentions it but then there'll be some other thing that um uh people get really attached to and that brothel scene like comes up again and again because I just introduce all the women who are working at this brothel and um yeah, people find it just moving and exciting. So I was really glad to be able to do that because I was, um, did a lot of thinking about sex workers in that time and how they lived and the agency they had, um, things like that. So I was glad they kind of came alive in not um, not a you know cartoonish way, but in this very uh, passionate, fun way. And each of them kind of was speaking to the reader. Mm -hmm. I think um, for people, I mean, who maybe aren't familiar with your writing, there's there's a lot of kind of cheek and humor, and that was it was as it was compassionate, and you did learn a lot, but it was it was clever and funny, so that was was very fun. Um, so we yeah. starting to. I always try and put humor in my work. Like when I'm writing it, it's always like joyful and funny, no matter how hard it is, because humor is, humor is just a way of opening the human heart. So when you make somebody laugh, you can communicate so much to them at that point and you give them away. It's also inviting somebody in and saying, you don't have to react in a certain way. You don't have to look um, down so you don't have to feel sorry. Just come in and see it and you know, that's why um, so many comedians come from terrible backgrounds because it's, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful gift. It's like, I will tell you these horrors, the squalor, but I'm going to tell it in a way that makes you laugh. And it's such um, a generous act, I find. Because mm. there are, I mean, there's definitely very serious um, topics and tragic topics and horrible topics that yeah. um, your book touches on as well. So I think the humor definitely helps with that. Um, I'm seeing we, we have a couple of questions coming in in the chats and some in the Q&A as well. So just um, if you're asking a question, we do ask that you put it in the Q&A section because um, then we will, that's where we'll be pulling them from. So um, for people who are doing that and we'll get to that soon. 
Um, yeah, is there, do you know, um, like, do you go further? And do you have like an editor pull you back sometimes or like how, cause there's, I mean, there's a lot of topics. There's a lot of violence and there's a little bit of like rape and there's lots of different um, topics that are covered in your book and some of your other writing as well. So how do you um, decide to deal with that or how do you deal with those um, more difficult topics? Um. I think it's, I think, as you said, there's, those are themes that I started working on even in my early twenties when I started writing. So there was a, there, I put so much thought into how I would be able to communicate these worlds um, with, you know, grace and compassion. So I think, and I think, and, and uh, so my, my, my editors, they never really, they never tell me to hold back in that way. They just, um, they do cut things down. Like sometimes, but sometimes I'll be, so, I'll be overly self-indulgent in an idea because I get so excited about an idea. And actually I remember with, um, cause there's a scene where, so Sadie who is from the Golden Mile but she gets exiled from her family. So she has to go down the hill to the Squalid Mile. And for some reason, like I couldn't get her there. Like it took so long. I was like pages of pages of every single thing she saw. Cause it was such, um, cause I wanted it to have this Alice in Wonderland effect where she just goes down the hole forever and ever and just sees all these different things. But then my editor was like, you know, both editors from the States and Canada were like, why, why does it take <laughs> Sadie so long to get down this hill? I'm like page after page. I was like, didn't you notice it had like an Alice in Wonderland effect? They're like, no, not at all. Just, she can take, she can take a page to get down that hill. And then, so, you know, it's like works like that, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Especially because from what I understand, the neighbors, the neighborhoods are right near each other. So. I think this is part of the interesting thing is that you had this like rich luxury and squalor like side yeah, by side it's true they're not actually that far but they were so different they were such completely different worlds, and there was no reason like you couldn't really you wouldn't just go for a walk if you were lower class um up in the golden mile you would just be sent home you had to have a reason to be up there and the same thing like someone from the Golden Mile would never go down to the Squalid Mile. Just obviously, they don't want to see that kind of life, and they'll just be, I don't know, robbed or their pocket watch will be taken <laughs> or whatever. You know, so they were so different, and I, so interesting how, even though they're geographically close, they were just worlds apart. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, we'll look at some of the. The Q and A. You mentioned Alice in Wonderland. Um, Janet um, is asking, "What were your favorite books in childhood?" Childhood. Um, well, I had a you know ridiculous affection for Lucy Maud Montgomery. Like um, that was actually problematic because I was so in love with Anne. I don't think like I could after I discovered Anne of Green Gables, I didn't even want to speak to anybody else in my neighborhood or my friends. I was just like, you guys all fall short. I have met this, this young woman named Anne who is my kindred spirit. Um, I loved her. What else did I love as a child? I loved um, so much stuff. I mean, I love those picture books. I read them if, like Mother Goose rhymes. I remember just, I had this um, giant old book. I think I have it right here. Like this belong, cause I started to read really young. I think I started reading um, like three or four and this belonged to my great grandmother, this old rickety book of nursery rhymes. And it's so grotesque inside. It's just full of like stains and whatever but I would just memorize them and um, read that all the time. So it was always so, um, yeah, it was, I read like everything would just go to the library and get your pile. That was so much fun. That was like the best memories of my childhood going to the library. And that day you spend the whole day choosing your, like whatever the maximum of books are. You go and you like, after eight hours of choosing, put it on the 
the desk and um, I remember Madeline by Louis Bemelman. What else did I absolutely love? Um, I really liked Scott O'Dell when I was younger, although I think he's problematic now. <laughs> he's been like kind of um, exhumed from the canon because we have other, um, but th that's just when I was very little. Um, and then, do you wanna know about like what I was interested in as a teenager? And then I started discovering like, um, I remember discovering Jean Genet was like a huge moment for me. And then I started actually, I think the original interest in Anna Green Gables was there was this young girl who was motherless and um, in this very lonely situation. So anything I could find that started off with somebody, um, cause I was motherless, my mother abandoned me. So anything that I found where a child was abandoned and was off for adventure, I was, I was just so, um, in love with it because I didn't really, you know, all my friends had mothers and kind of came from these like normal households. So then I found, um, I had to go into books and I found these other lost children. And I was like, oh, I'm not alone. I just, for some reason I am outside and they are inside. And I was like, how do I get inside? If I could only get in the book, then I would have my friends. And then I was like, oh, I'll just start writing. Yeah. And now you write about them. Exactly. Now I just create more, <laughs> more to people than this. Um, Janet asked, um, how old were you when you began writing? Uh, I started keeping a journal when I was, um, I think seven or eight. So I wouldn't call it serious writing, but I did write in it every day, which, um, I think that was a great gift. I would, I don't know why, if, if I had, I think that's a fun thing to get kids into just the idea of journal keeping. And um, not only does it, it just, and, and they're just little short entries, but not only do you really learn how to write from that, but you also, it teaches you just how to observe things in society and to see yourself as like the main character. And I think so often we fall into um, in life, this feeling of like we're being swept away by other people. So I like the idea, you're just the main character and your thoughts are important. That's, that's what I love about writing too. Like it gives it, you this idea that your thoughts um, are somehow of great value. So I, I, I love that as a child. Yeah. Um, we have a question here from uh, Wendy um, asking if you ever do workshops for writers. Um, I do, I've done them before, yeah. I don't have any plan during COVID, but um, yeah, those are always fun. And one of the things I always, um, one of my favorite prompts during writers workshops is um, I always tell people to write about a memory that is sort of like a foundational anecdote. So it's like something that you remember, like a story that you always tell, like when you, um, you know, when you meet someone for the first time or your first date, you have those anecdotes that you share for the first time because you you're like, this just sums up. This is my favorite story of myself. So if you take that, because we, the way we tell stories to each other is the same way we write. We just find these like ways to stage story and like we make them into narratives already. So we already have these wonderful stories. So I always get everyone to write one of those um, sort of foundational memories and they can be so funny. Like it could be like somebody, um, um, when someone was telling a story that their mother had offered them a banana and they were very young was their earliest memory and they told the mother they didn't want the banana and then they went to school and all day they just felt so guilty about not eating the banana and whether their mother was unhappy about it and then this kind of haunted them for weeks and they just didn't want it anyway so it's just this that's that's what I would do if this was a workshop now I'd get you all to like write about like some a like a little tiny memory and you just realize how these these little tiny moments that we just put meaning around um and that's what writing is just these little mundane or shocking mundane or shocking but it's it's more the meaning we put around it mm -hmm. um there's another question here how does your family react to the characters you create especially those 
with questionable motives or character flaws? Um, do they worry about you? And both a silly and a serious like, question. <laughs> um, I don't really have like a big extended family. I was uh, raised by my father and my father was, um, he was like a, just like a petty criminal. And uh, in his later years, he just worked as a janitor because he had a record and whatnot. But he was, he had so many like rough, crazy stories that he would tell me even when I was a little girl and all his friends were like, um, you know, bank robbers. And they would just sit around the table telling these stories that I quite enjoyed. They were very animated and funny. So it's just to say like, that at least, I mean, it was very inappropriate way to raise a little girl, but at least it gave me the sense of like, there was nothing I could say or do that would um, shock them. Yeah. Um, and then I think um, you've made those stories into a book as well. Oh yeah, I have a little wisdom and nonsense, which is lessons that I learned from having like a, um, a father who was like unsuccessful criminal. I would say petty crook. So I'm like, yeah, it's like, but he was a criminal, but we didn't make any money from it. Mm -hmm. um, if so people are interested in other than like reading the book that we're talking about tonight, if people are interested in other books that you've read, is there something that they should start with? Or I also have a poll that we can ask people to see if anyone has read books by you. So but is there a place that people should start or it doesn't matter? Um, I, sorry, I couldn't see anything because the poll was in oh, the computer screen. Um, I, I mean, I'm always partial to my last book. It's sort of like one of those people when they, they meet somebody new if you're in a new relationship and you're just this person's the one and everyone's like boy that's what you said about the last one I'm like no I was mistaken uh this is the one um so obviously this is my favorite and then um I really like the Lonely Hearts Hotel I think my first one Lullabies for Little Criminals um it's so long ago that it almost seems I mean it's not that long ago but I think I've just become such a different person it seems like a lifetime ago to me so I feel odd recommending that one but that's one that people love so if you're not doing this one either um Lonely Heart to Tell or a Little Advice for Little Criminals um yeah so I'm just looking at the poll um and out of people who've answered um only 40 percent of people have read a book by you before. So 60% um, of people who answered are still beginners. So that's exciting. Welcome. Fun. Um, Nancy had a question. How much time do you spend promoting and marketing your books instead of just writing? Um, a lot but like I, I usually I write at the same time because it does uh it does take up a lot of time especially when when a book comes out and you do a lot of marketing and stuff but there's so much uh there's just so much you kind of constantly have to be doing to reach out to people and you know writing essays and whatnot or doing stuff like this so I don't I don't know what the question is like during it for a period of day or a period of time. I don't know. It gets crazy like after a book comes out, but then you end up having like between books, you'll have years of doing nothing, sitting in your living room and writing. Wonderful. Um, we have a very book specific question. Um, so Avery um, asks uh, the character of, uh, Jan Pauline is amazing. Is she a mother figure for George and Mary? Um, offering advice and suggestions on how to live life. Do you think women need this type of womanly support? Um, do you think these women still exist today? Slightly evil, yet helpful? Yeah, um, she was like, I loved her too, because she was um, the older character in the book. So she was the oldest of them all, and she's. Um, 
she's just wiser and she just gives them perspective but she she has um yeah such a macabre um twist in her you know she just believes if if a husband is abusive then a woman has the right to murder them to get them out of the way because and she's always like supplying um arsenic and poisonous pills to anybody who wants them but at the same time she's just she's just so wonderful because she's she has such perspective and also she's able to see really um the different talents of the women when she's bringing them together for revolution she's like you're and she tells them that what values they have and encouragement in a way that um because a lot of them are essentially motherless or estranged from their mothers because of you know victorian society and the way they were acting kind of puts them outside of society so she does actually yeah she she's like um a mother figure to them i would say so um we've had some we have some comments coming in in the q a as well um Janet says that she joined the webinar because she heard a reviewer on CBC raving about this book. Um, and then um, someone else said that they just got it um, for their Kobo. So they're going to be reading it soon. <laughs> so that's wonderful. Um, Jane asked if there's a place that you prefer to write from and why you prefer to write there. Um, I always write in bed. I think um, I don't know why I find I find writing like physically exhausting. It just drains me. So I like to um, I just need to I just need to be lying down to do it. Like even like sitting up because there's so many hours and it's just like it's like even when I'm lying down. I'm always trying to do something that's not gonna um, just kill my back. So. Um, and I like being in bed and then my dogs like being in the bed and we just kind of, I have this big bed and just clutter and it's like, yeah, I just operate from there. So that's the truth of it. Wonderful. Um, let's see. Um, we have still lots of questions, which is great. Um, oh no, sorry, I have a cat alert. Um, I'm just trying to find um, one person, uh, Janet has said, your life has been full of extremely interesting um, with many tensions. And she's wondering if you think that's what is needed to unleash creativity. Hmm. That's like a perennial question. We always ask ourselves that. Like um, I saw this study once that was done in New York and it found that um, it actually was true that children with um, unhappy childhood were like more likely to become creative and uh enter into like the arts because it i think what it does is um it's obviously not necessary that's you know it's so you can write about anything and um but i do think that why you do end up having a lot of these strange um figures throughout time uh with the most abominable childhoods becoming writers is I think that kind of puts you, it puts you outside of society. And there's some, when you're put outside of society, then you always, um, you just become an observer of it, even just try and figure out, okay, what do I need to do to get into this society? And it really makes you break it down. So it makes you kind of, um, it, see, it gives you this perspective and this radical view and this realization like wait a second maybe it's not me maybe there's not something wrong with society um so i think it's that it's that it forces you to be an outsider and to see things from a different perspective probably it's probably also there's been so many um great novelists who were gay and that's also they were also um you know, always a bit outside of society and living like on the fringes and um, having all their social engagements outside of the mainstream. So they're just able, so then when they talk about society of manners, because they're so used to observing and trying to um, act in a way that isn't how they normally want to act, then you end up with these marvelous observations about human nature and you're like, how did you come up with this? And it's like, because I was thrown out and I was forced to watch it like the 
from the window. That's very envious. Mm -hmm. like um, and maybe we'll see how long. You have two minutes before eight o'clock. Um, so uh, Lana uh, uh, said she's fascinated by the names of characters in books. Um, mm -hmm. And how did you choose the names for the characters in this book? Um, this one was really fun because whichever I named them uh, was a play on the names of whichever French revolutionary character that was slate that had inspired them. So Marie Antoine is actually Marie Antoinette's real name. Um, so that was easy. And then Sadie Arnett was based on the Marquis de Sade. So I took the name. Um, then he, he was such an aristocrat that all he had so many names like those um, aristocrats did. So I just, and the, he's only known by Sade. So Sadie. And then uh, Mary Robespierre is based on her name I got from Maximilian Robespierre. And George is actually um, George Danton. And Jean Pauline Marais is based on Jean Paul Marais, who was this um, completely ludicrous, bloodthirsty revolutionary. Um, and I think that's, am I missing anybody? No, I think those are my main characters. So I actually um, had spun their names out of um, historical characters, which some people, some people have, um, usually don't, people don't pick up on them all, except, um, and some people pick up on a couple, but so that's how I got their names. Mm. Um, wonderful. Well, it's, I don't know, do you have time for one more question? Sure. Okay, because this one was asked by two different people. Um, so do you use, um, a pen or a pencil, or do you write on the computer, or do you write by hand or on the computer? And this will be our last question of the night. I always write longhand in my notebooks. Um, I just, there's something, I'm a little bit of a graph maniac. I love that feeling also you can put little arrows. And um, so I write in a notebook and then when I'm done, I type up all my notes and then I edit on the computer. But it always comes first in longhand my notebooks. Excellent. Well, um, thank you so much for joining us. It was wonderful. Um, your book is definitely a treat. So if people at home would like to um, get a copy for themselves, you can order it from your Muskoka library. Um, and I think it's slightly cheaper because we get it right from the publisher. So make sure you contact your library um, tonight or tomorrow um, to get a copy and they all come with a signed book plate. So make sure you get that in. Um, don't forget to follow your library's social media or newsletters because um, I think we have a different author almost every month and we are uh, looking at which ones are going to be in the summer and the fall and there's some amazing authors to choose from um, and if you have um, any other questions um, Heather uh, do you have social media or where can people follow you to find out when the next book comes out or any uh, of that I'm on, I'm on Twitter my um, you can find me on Twitter my, my Twitter handle is actually like lethal heroin heroin with an e and it's actually an anagram of my name but if you look heather o'neill it'll pop up and uh, thank you so much sarah that was a really fun conversation and thank you everyone who came thank you everyone take care and have Bye. a good night